In 2013, 16 members of the Auckland Alpine Club made what they believed to be a routine ascent of Mount Taranaki. They broke up into smaller groups, and then chaos ensued, plunging them into a desperate struggle to stay alive. For centuries, Mount Taranaki has been a sacred site for the Maori people, who believed the mountain was a dwelling place of spirits and gods. They held rituals and ceremonies on its slopes to honor the powerful forces that had shaped their world. It is an active stratovolcano, also known as Mount Egmont, and its height of 8,200 feet 2,518 meters make it the second highest mountain in the North Island of New Zealand. The Tasman Sea and the west coast of New Zealand surround it. It is one of the most interesting volcanoes in the world because it is perfectly symmetrical. The environment around Mount Taranaki is notoriously hostile for life. Few animals could live in these harsh conditions all year round. Strong winds frequently batter the mountain and cover it in dense fog. However, in autumn, things change. To the untrained eye, conditions appear to be almost summery, with the upper reaches of the mountain covered in a thin coating of ice or frozen rain, known as verglass. But this is just a deceptive calm. Verglass makes climbing exceptionally challenging, even for the experienced mountaineers equipped with crampons and ice axes. The surface is a treacherous plane of glass, and a single misstep could mean a fatal fall. Mount Taranaki had been the scene of numerous accidents and fatalities due to a combination of factors. The mountain was easy to get to by road and had a classic volcanic shape that looked gentle at first, but got steeper as you got closer to the top. The climb began as something that pretty much everybody could manage, but quickly became a challenge only for those that were technically proficient and equipped with the right climbing gear. The mountain is also vulnerable to lahars, deadly mud flows that could sweep away everything in their path from hikers and climbers to entire villages. These sudden natural disasters, which were often the result of volcanic activity or heavy rain, posed a constant threat to those who lived or worked nearby. Moreover, the mountain had a long and storied history of major eruptions which had shaped the landscape and left a vast ring plain that is now used for farming and agriculture. Scientists warn that the mountain is long overdue to erupt. It had shown no signs of activity for 200 years, which is unusual for an active stratovolcano like Mount Taranaki. The group set to summit Mount Taranaki was an eclectic mix of climbers, each with their own unique skills and experiences. On October 26, 2013, the 16 climbers arrived at Tahurani Lodge late the night before they were set to climb. They planned to climb in two groups. One would tackle the North Ridge, which was grade minus one, and the other the harder East Ridge, grade plus two. The climbers had been preparing for months. It meant so much to them. It was a chance to conquer Mount Taranaki. They had trained relentlessly, studying maps, checking weather forecasts, and going through different safety procedures to make sure everything was ready and that they would be good to go, and most importantly, stay safe. Despite the fact that there was an ominous weather forecast, Rowan, the trip organizer for the Auckland Alpine Club's annual Labor Day weekend climb, hesitated to cancel the expedition. He exchanged emails with a climber weighing the pros and cons of the decision. Despite the looming sense of danger, they ultimately agreed to push through with the trip. Little did they know, their decision would have harrowing consequences. The group leader sent an email out to the team, letting them know and warning them of the approaching storm that would hit by mid-afternoon the day they were set to climb, and stating that they had to reach the summit and descend before the weather turned. Hiroki Ogawa was a brilliant geoscientist, passionate about all things geological and nature. Having completed his studies at the University of Auckland, he had now taken up a research fellowship and tutoring position at the university. Hiroki was an avid climber. He had been a member of the New Zealand Alpine Club's Auckland branch for years and had ran classes on rock climbing for other enthusiasts. Originally from Japan, Hiroki had made New Zealand his home, drawn by the beauty of its mountains. He was 31 years old and had already achieved so much. But this thirst for adventure that he had and exploration remained insatiable. Nicole Sutton had grown up near Martin, New Zealand, in a world of rolling hills and picturesque landscapes. Her passion for the environment had led her to study environmental science and commerce, and she had worked for an environmental planning consultancy. But her life changed two years ago, 
when she met Hiroki. They quickly fell in love. It was love at first sight, sharing a passion for the natural world and a deep sense of adventure. Nicole's a big skier and snowboarder. She really likes the icy terrain of the mountains. But she was new to mountaineering and climbing. She was looking forward to climbing Mount Taranaki with Hiroki and spend more time with her future love. And he intended to pop the question to her at the summit. Other members of the Alpine Club included Kirsten, an experienced rock climber, but a newcomer to the group. Michael was a professional climber with years of experience in some of the world's most challenging environments. Jeremy was a seasoned veteran, having climbed the mountain many times before. He was a search and rescue team member and knew the mountain kind of like the back of his hand. And then there was Mike, a veteran of the rescue world. He had been doing rescue work for 25 years, and there really wasn't much that he hadn't seen. Finally, John was a seasoned British climber with years of experience. On October 26, 2013, the group had started their climb at 7.30 a.m., expecting to complete the circuit in about six hours. They had split up their earlier traverse around the mountain to the east side, but regrouped at East Ridge for a break. The sun was shining, and the surface snow was turning kind of slushy, making their climb a lot slower than expected. Working your way through this slush is kind of hard and very tiresome because there's extra weight to maneuver through. At 4.30 p.m., they kept going up the mountain, even though snow was expected to come, and the wind chill was 7 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 14 degrees Celsius. At this point, Nicole changed her mind and switched from the group tackling the easier Northridge to join Hiroki, aiming for the harder Eastridge route. When they were 1,600 vertical feet or 500 meters from the summit, the face briefly steepened to 45 degrees. This was a big change for them, and the team decided to then tie themselves into ropes for safety. They had planned to only rope climb the most exposed upper section of the summit. However, with the novice climbers preferring the security of being tethered to the mountain, they decided to then use ropes for the rest of the ascent. The Alpine Club Snowcraft course syllabus had removed this rope hitching skills section, so the recent graduates that were in the group and went on this climb were pretty inexperienced. With five people on a 180 foot or 60 meter rope, each pitch took more than an hour to climb. Hiroki and John were off to the right on a smaller rope that was about 100 feet or 30 meters. As the group approached the summit, Rowan began to worry about Nicole's safety. He noticed that she only had one ice axe and was moving slowly in the new boots that she wore for this particular trip. He asked Kirsten to climb with her to ensure that Nicole had the support she needed. However, the dynamic was tricky because there was really no leader of the group and everyone had signed a pre-trip waiver explaining that they were responsible for themselves. Despite this, many of the climbers looked to Rowan for his leadership, given his experience as an instructor on the snowcraft course. Despite the urge to take control, he fought against it and let everybody do what they wanted to do. As they continued up the mountain, two members of the group, Michael Pavin and Brendan Wallace, grew cold and frustrated. They finally decided that they wanted to get off that rope and climb on their own in order to get to the top using their ice axes. Brendan was the first to crest the shark's tooth part of the mountain, but the wind was so strong he couldn't even stand. An hour and a half after leaving the group, Michael and Brendan returned, and they warned Rowan that they needed to get down the mountain immediately. Rowan initially wanted to get over the top and make it to the summit, and then go down the easy way, but the wind was picking up and the clouds were moving across the summit at an alarming speed. Group member Susan was showing signs of hypothermia, and the cold was taking its toll on everyone at this point. Rowan gave his down jacket to Susan and he had to put it on her himself as she was so cold she could barely move. And as he looked closer, there was ice all over her. Clearly, it was time to get off the mountain and find a safe way down. Kirsten yelled up to Hiroki and John that Rowan's group was calling off the climb and they were gonna go down. The group of four huddled to discuss their options. Kirsten was hesitant about going down the same intimidating face they had just climbed up because it was very hard and windy and the conditions were really horrible and Hiroki kind of agreed with her that they should go up first. They made their decision, and they started their ascent. As they made their way up the volcano, they finally reached the crater, and they couldn't believe it, but the storm intensified even more, and Kirsten noticed that Nicole was really struggling. The wind iced everything in seconds because the weather changed so quickly, resembling a freeze gun in a video game. 
Kirsten had to break the ice off her hood to put it up over her helmet. Nicole was freezing cold and wanted to sleep, which raised alarm bells for Kirsten because she knew that Nicole was actually just showing signs of hypothermia. The wind was so strong, it whipped the rope over Kirsten and Hiroki's heads as they waited. Finally, Hiroki whipped out his GPS to calculate the drop into the crater's bottom so they could lower themselves into it and hopefully be protected from the weather. He instructed Kirsten to hang on to the rope at the bottom, as the wind was so strong it could actually blow her away. As they moved towards the rock spine known as the Lizard in the dark, blowing gale of the crater, Kirsten felt relieved that they were finally over the top and slightly protected. But suddenly Nicole slipped while climbing down backwards, unroped, and Kirsten felt something hit her hard, and whatever it was was gone. John caught the flash of movement out of the corner of his eye and thought whoever it was was definitely dead. After hitting Kirsten, Nicole managed to stop herself, but she was upset that she had caused the fall and potentially almost killed someone. Hiroki couldn't believe what just happened and immediately tried to call Rowan to deliver the bad news, but it was already sundown around 9.15pm. Meanwhile, when Nicole hit Kirsten, Kirsten careened 450 feet or 150 meters, sliding down in the pitch black on her belly and feet first. Kirsten knew that she needed to stop herself and she would only get one shot. That's when her Snowcraft survival training kicked in, thrusting an ice axe against the slope with the force of her entire body weight behind it. It wasn't instantaneous, but the axe was able to get into the mountain and eventually stop her. At that time, she didn't know the horror that awaited her below, the part of the mountain called the body catcher. Kirsten's heart raced as she checked her injuries. A red liquid seeped through the snow from her knee and ankle, and her left side was battered and bruised. Alone and injured on the treacherous mountain, she knew she had to keep moving. So, with nothing and no one in sight, she began climbing straight back up, ignoring the pain and fear. As she climbed, a flicker of light caught her eye. It was John coming down to see if she was okay. But they needed to hurry. Kirsten's injuries were worsening by the second and the icy chill of the mountain threatened to kill them. John led the way, moving fast through the freezing wind and snow. Kirsten struggled to keep up, her ankle throbbing and her hand curled into a claw it was so cold. But she refused to give up. With each step, she counted out the beats of her heart, pushing through to make it off the mountain. Kirsten and John were lost and exhausted, their bodies beaten down by the grueling climb. They had been walking for hours in the dark, following footprints that eventually led them to what seemed like a cliff. They had no choice but to turn back, feeling defeated and hopeless. As they trudged through the snow, Kirsten's hand was in even more pain and she could barely stand it now. John prayed for the second time that they would survive. They finally stopped and tried to shelter themselves from the harsh weather, digging a shallow trench and using their gear as a makeshift shelter. But the cold was relentless, seeping through their clothing and bones. They tried to sleep, but it was a fruitless effort. John had nothing to secure himself to the mountain, and they both knew that there was a danger of falling off the little ledge that they were sleeping on. John turned on his locator beacon out of desperation, knowing that it was likely that they wouldn't make it. Still, they huddled together and prayed for a miracle. The thought of their bodies being found was kind of a grim comfort. Safely off the mountain, Rowan's worries mounted as time passed. He paced back and forth inside the lodge. The climb down the east ridge had been very dangerous and they had barely made it back in one piece. His entire group was still shocked by what they had to go through. They had rushed and even dropped some of their gear to make it back safely at around 8.30 p.m. But the four climbers, John, Kirsten, Hiroki, and Nicole were nowhere to be seen. Rowan's heart sank as he considered the possibility of them falling or getting lost on the mountain. The clock ticked by slowly as they waited, hoping for some sign of their missing friends. There was nothing. The wind outside howled like a banshee, as if mocking their efforts. Hiroki's heart pounded as he texted a message to the lodge. Nicole was hypothermic and Kirsten had fallen. He and Nicole were still moving. The howling wind made it nearly impossible to hear anything. They had to keep going, but every step was a battle. Meanwhile, the climbers at the lodge had already contacted police, and Rowan and Brendan were gearing up for a full rescue attempt. 
The area just beyond the lodge was iced over, and above it, a blizzard raged with 50 mile per hour winds. Ron was determined to save Nicole and Hiroki, but he needed an ice axe just to break open his own backpack buckle. Rowan and Brendan finally made it to the lizard part of the mountain, but the wind was so strong there they weren't able to continue up and had to bail on the rescue. At 11.57 p.m., they texted the rest of the members at the lodge that they had to come back and postpone the rescue. Hiroki and Nicole were still marooned on the mountain, trapped in the unforgiving storm. A little bit earlier, at 11.30 p.m., Hiroki texted that Nicole was in extremely bad shape. She was still kind of there, but slightly disoriented, and it wasn't safe to climb at all in her condition. And then he sent another one about 10 minutes later, saying that he dug a shallow trench to try to get out of the elements a little bit. With no shovel, Hiroki scraped through about two feet of snow and ice with his ice axe and helmet to make the shelter. This took so much energy out of him. Finally, he was able to get Nicole out of the wind, and he texted the group another time that he needed to make a bigger shelter just for himself so he could also be protected. But there was just too much ice around to really do anything. When Hiroki texted his GPS coordinates, Rowan looked at them and he could not believe where Hiroki and Nicole actually were on the mountain. They were about 650 feet below the summit above the lizard and barely lower than where John and Kirsten had left them. They pretty much made it nowhere on their attempt to get down the mountain. Rowan knew that they were in a seriously dangerous position. He texted them, do whatever you can to make shelter and protect yourself. The police were already on their way, but it would take some time for them to actually get there. Rescuers Jeremy and Mike had settled in for the evening when they got a call from the police. They weren't sure what it was about, but they knew something was really wrong. They were told that there was two climbers that were lost on the mountain and they were asked if they could help. At that point, it was raining where they were and because of this, they knew that the mountain would have extremely bad weather. They didn't hesitate to answer the call and they knew that it was going to be an extremely long night and they would have to fight for their own survival while trying to make a rescue attempt. Just past midnight, the Taranaki Alpine Cliff Rescue Team arrived at the Tahurangi Lodge. Brendan and Rowan were able to make it back to the lodge just as the search team was leaving, warning them about the treacherous conditions on the mountain. There was five rescuers that started the search, but one had to turn back because he was getting disoriented. That left Mike, Jeremy, and Jonathan to continue. They braced themselves against the gusting winds and freezing temperatures, focusing on each step. After climbing just a short while on the mountain, they decided to turn back due to hypothermia and exhaustion. It was so dangerous out there. These rescuers almost died. The rescuers knew that the chances of Hiroki and Nicole living was just about zero. They couldn't have done much even if they had got to Hiroki and Nicole. Mike and Jeremy had been climbing for 20 hours and losing a member wasn't part of the plan. Still stuck on the mountain, Kirsten and John got ready for the worst night of their lives after John turned on his rescue beacon. Kirsten couldn't stop shivering and had shooting pains coming from all over her body, but John was able to get a few hours of sleep. In the morning, John was soaked to the skin. Kirsten's ankle was fat and swollen. They left their packs and started walking until John spotted a wooden pole in the distance, the first sign of hope. They should have turned right towards the lodge, but they turned left instead, confused and disoriented. But this mistake gave them the chance to save their own life. And then they met a couple asking for directions to Veronica Track, which felt surreal given they were in a fight for their lives just moments ago. The couple was able to help them and Kirsten talked herself through the pain, focusing on her teaching days and anything to distract her from the agonizing pain in her ankle. And that hand that was curling earlier actually had frostbite. At 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, the New Plymouth Police desperately tried to reach Conrad Smith, the search and rescue contact at the park for a rescue mission on Mount Taranaki. There was still four people stranded on the mountain but most of the Taranaki Alpine rescuers were on their own adventures during that long holiday weekend. The Ruapehu Alpine Rescue Organization received a call and sent three searchers just in time for a pickup by an Air Force helicopter. However, they couldn't carry more search and rescue crew as they were already loaded with heavy gear and a full crew. This was a big problem. 
At 6.45 a.m., Paul Andreasen received a text asking for help with the search and rescue on Mount Taranaki. Although he had never been there, mountains were his passion and he had a background in ski patrolling and emergency nursing. He offered to help assist the search teams right away. As the morning dawned, Paul Andreasen joined the searchers at the park, ready for a helicopter pickup. But the helicopter never showed up as police command decided to save the pilot flying hours for a possible weather window. Despite another helicopter being available, it was never called. Meanwhile, Nicole, who is doing better than Hiroki at this point, texted Rowan, pleading for a helicopter rescue. Hiroki was in horrible shape and they both had hypothermia, but Hiroki was more exposed than Nicole. Nicole was also still exposed to the weather, but not as bad. The two helicopters tried to help, but heavy turbulence and downdrifts made it impossible for them to reach the two. Ground searchers, including Alpine and Land and Search rescue teams, also surrounded the mountain. However, the beacon John had left on his pack was old and it was unable to give an accurate location of him, leading searchers to believe it was coming from Holly Hut miles away from where Kirsten and John were stranded. Time was running out and the weather was not improving. Despite it being daylight at this point, the wind was battering the rescue teams to reach Nicole and Hiroki's little ice cave agonizingly close each time before being forced back. By 5 p.m., the searchers retreated to the lodge, leaving Nicole increasingly desperate. She sent a text begging for a helicopter to rescue them, warning that Hiroki wouldn't make it through the night. While this was going on, the rescue crew finally got to Tahuringi Lodge. They were frustrated that the police were taking so long and not telling them anything. They began formulating their own plan to fix ropes and push through to Hiroki and Nicole. Tensions were high and the rescue team medic asked for help from the police to keep things under control. The rescuers were starting to fight amongst themselves. Eventually, they agreed on a plan and decided to rest before setting out later in the night. The first two teams left the lodge around 12.30 a.m battling storm force winds and heavy ice as they fixed ropes and pushed forward. By the time they reached the crater valley, they were down on all fours, huddling for warmth and communication. Finally, they set the ropes and turned back for the lodge at 2 a.m., exhausted but determined to keep going. Paul Andreasen, who was the most experienced wilderness doctor, was told to find the freezing couple that no one else had been able to find. At dawn, he and a group of rescuers heard the sound of a helicopter overhead and knew they were close. At 6.30 a.m., they found Hiroki and Nicole in a shallow snow cave. Hiroki was unresponsive, likely from getting too hot and sweaty while digging the trench and then freezing. Nicole lay there, shivering and weak. Her hand was frozen and her mind clouded. She was able to speak, though, and asked if it was Monday. When they told her that Hiroki died, her heart sank, but she was a fighter and she held on. The rescuers worked frantically, hacking through the ice and setting up a safety line on the treacherous slope. But Nicole's breathing grew weaker and weaker, and they knew they had to act fast. Paul pulled out an emergency mask and began pumping warm air into Nicole's lungs. They took turns helping her, but it was a losing battle. As they waited for more rescuers to come help them, they checked her vital signs, but there was none. She was gone. The rescuers were also still in danger. They knew they had to move, but they were exhausted and running out of warmth. They dug holes in the snow just to keep themselves from freezing. On the way down, a paramedic on the radio told Paul he couldn't declare them dead without a CO2 monitor. It was a cruel blow, a complete disconnect from reality on the mountain. When they finally made it back to the lodge, Paul sat outside and smoked a cigarette, gutted by the loss. He had knelt face to face with Nicole until her end, and he knew that he would never forget that moment. During the search and rescue debrief, the search faced criticism for communication failures and lack of joint training, while police blamed the failure to call in that extra helicopter on a misunderstanding. Paul Andreasen replayed in his mind what happened on the mountain, wondering what he could have done. But even if they had reached Hiroki and Nicole earlier, it's unclear whether the outcome would have been any different. Despite criticism, searchers like Jeremy Beckers continued to put their lives on the line. The question of why Hiroki and Nicole stayed so high on the mountain remains unanswered. Kirsten believes that a series of decisions rather than one thing led to the tragedy. 
She bears physical scars from the night on the mountain. One of her fingers is numb from frostbite, and she still feels anxious about whiteouts. John credits Hiroki's technical skill for his own survival on the mountain, and he keeps climbing, even though he's emotionally hurt. I want to say thanks for watching the video, and remember to subscribe if you like the content. As always, please be extra nice to the like button, and I have many other disaster videos on my channel for you to check out. I hope to see you at the next one.